Have you ever had that feeling when you're in the shower, you're singing along to your favorite song, and you just close your eyes and let the water run all over you, and you get tingles down your spine because you feel like someone may be watching, and you think to yourself, don't be silly, I've probably been listening to way too much true crime. But then you think, if there was someone there, maybe they're waiting for the moment that you close your eyes and become completely vulnerable. It's the same feeling you get when you're on a run and you've got music going through your headphones and you're just losing yourself to the rhythm of the beat and the stomping of your feet against the pavement. You suddenly feel like there's another presence close by or there's someone watching you from the shadowy woods waiting to snatch you up. Most of the time, these moments of crippling fear are short-lived or we shrug them off as being irrational or unrealistic. But what if one day what you feared the most became a reality? What if the imagined danger stepped out from the shadows and revealed itself? Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberleya. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. Before we begin, I want to thank today's sponsor and that is Fetch. You already know how much I love using the Fetch app. I read the comments all the time and I know a lot of you have said that you like it too. How many points do you have right now? Because I am almost at 30,000 points. If you don't know what Fetch is, it's a super easy, fast and free app where you can earn free gift cards when you snap pictures of your receipts. After you snap, you can redeem those points for hundreds of gift cards, including Amazon, Visa, Starbucks, GameStop, Walmart, and more. Fetch is 100% free and so easy to use. It's quick and easy. You snap your receipts, earn points, and redeem those points for gift cards all on your phone. The points you earn turn into those gift cards, and my favorites are probably Amazon and Starbucks. Actually, I just went to Starbucks in the middle of the tropical storm that we're having here in LA right now. And I made sure not to get my receipt wet because I gotta get those points. And you'll earn points for every purchase, whether you're buying things for fun or your necessities. Just snap your receipts from restaurants or any retail stores. Fetch even links to your email so you can earn points on all your e-receipts and it connects to your Amazon account so you can get points for all those purchases to watch. Here are all of my e-receipts. And here's how it works. I'll show you with today's Starbucks receipt. Just open the app, click on the orange camera button, snap a picture of your receipt, and make sure the store name, the date, and the time are visible. Then wait for those three green check marks and swipe up and submit. That's it. You can even tap to play for an extra daily reward every 24 hours. Plus, you can look for brands in the Fetch app. And if you buy any of those items, you can earn even more points. So check out the link in the description box or scan the QR code on the screen if you're on TV, computer, or a casting device and use the code Kimber to get 100 points when you snap your very first receipt. Try it now before this offer ends. And thanks so much to Fetch for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get into the case for today. I always forget to say, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. I also quickly wanted to announce the third winner of the Crime Con ticket. Amanda S. If that's your first name and your last initial, congratulations and don't forget to check your email for further information. I can't wait to see you there. If you read the title of this video, then you probably know a little more than you usually do about what's gonna go on in this case. There's a lot more to it than a mother of three going missing after walking on a trail. But if this sounds familiar, you may have heard about the Rachel Moran murder. That just happened on August 5th, 2023, just this month. And I don't cover unsolved cases for obvious reasons. The killers are still out there. This is real life. But coincidentally, as I was in the middle of researching this case a couple weeks ago, Rachel Moran was reported missing after telling her boyfriend that she was going to take a run on a popular trail that she frequented on a regular basis. She never came home. And while that case is still unfolding, I have been stunned at how eerily similar these two cases are. It's almost like watching this case play out years later. I don't want to confuse you, but I am going to be talking about both of the cases. I'm not going to be going into the Rachel Moran case because, like I said, it's unsolved. But since there are so many very odd similarities, it will be weaved in. I don't want any of you to get confused. I think I do a pretty good job of mapping everything out, but I just could not believe it. And I don't want to say too much right now, but if you haven't heard about Rachel's ongoing case, 
She's a mother of five who was found murdered on the Ma Pa Heritage Trail in Bel Air, Maryland. DNA was left behind, though at this point police haven't said what type, we can only assume, but it has been recently matched to another case all the way here in Los Angeles. However, even though the two profiles match, the suspect is not currently in the system. Therefore, they don't know who it is. And I'm sure genetic genealogy could help, but for now, they've released a very confusing video of who they say is the same man that attacked a young girl here in LA. And on this ring doorbell footage, we see him leaving this home invasion. Oddly, you can see a person's arm shutting the door behind him. Presumably that is the teenage victim. Now, this is the only thing the police have right now to identify this man. They believe he's in his late or mid-20s. He's 5'9", about 160 pounds of muscular build, and of Hispanic descent. I think they're going to find this guy. This was a very violent crime, and so is the one that I'm about to talk about today. One that could easily happen to any of us, and those are the ones that scare me the most. It's a story that confirms that nightmares can, in the blink of an eye, become a living, breathing reality. Finally, I want to introduce you to the subject of our case today, Kathleen Louise Aiello, who everyone called Kathy. She was born on August 9th, 1953 in New Mexico to parents Paul and Helga. Kathy had two sisters, Loretta and Serena, and three brothers, William, Leo, and Joseph. This was one of those rare occasions where I couldn't find much information about Kathy's childhood and her upbringing, but it seems like her family eventually made their way out to Antioch, California. Now, Kathy met Jeffrey Lyon in the 70s, and by the time she was 23, the couple were married and having their first child together. Michael was born June of 1976. Four years later, Eric came along in December of 1980, and then the baby of the family, Marissa, was born three years later in August of 1983. Ultimately, after raising their children together, Kathy and Jeffrey couldn't make it work between the two of them, and after a very difficult divorce, which was finalized in 1997, Kathy was the single mom of three kids. Michael was 21, Eric was 17, and Marissa was only 14 at the time, but it was for the best. Kathy's friend said she was always outgoing and fun, but after the divorce was finalized, it's like she lit up. She became even more vibrant, vivacious, and spontaneous. She was revived and refreshed and living in California with her three children. By the year 2000, Kathy took a job as an executive assistant to Gerald Braswell, the general manager for a company called Cistron Donner, and it was about 20 minutes away in Concord. She was in Antioch at the time, and they specialized in developing sensors and encoding equipment for military and the automotive market. Basically, they make products that provide guidance, navigation, and location solutions. Cistron Donner products are used in business aircraft, fighter jets, and even the Mars rover. All of this to say, they make very important parts for planes and other aerospace systems. So a pretty large and successful company that Kathy was working for, and she was excited. She had started a new chapter in her life. She had this new job, she was dating again, and she was a very attractive woman. She was blonde, she had the almond-shaped eye, she was in shape, active, and many people who were friends and coworkers of hers said that even though Kathy was in her 40s, her personality and her attitude made her look much younger like she was only in her 30s. Kathy was a people person, which made her great at her job. Being helpful, organized, and a hard worker were qualities that made Kathy stand out at her workplace. And while working at Cistron, Kathy was introduced to the son of one of her coworkers. His name is Johannes Lorek. He was from Austria, and the two of them just hit it off. He made her feel like she could be herself, and he accepted her for who she was and her three children. And they began a long-distance relationship with him out in Austria. But they planned getaways together whenever they both had the time, and Kathy loved to see and experience the world. Whether it was by air or by sea, she even loved sailing because she had a deep connection with the ocean. She clearly had an adventurous spirit, and her love for new experiences was perfect for Johannes because he liked that too. They went skiing together, they would travel, having a nice romantic dinner was what they loved the most, or a glass of wine together. But in the beginning of the year 2003, Kathy and Johannes went on a skiing trip to the Swiss Alps. During that trip, while they were at Lake Munse, surrounded by lush greens and deep blues of Switzerland, Johannes got down on one knee and asked Kathy to be his wife. 
They were very excited about spending their lives together. So just weeks later, Johannes made his way to the States, and the couple said their I do's. Even though they had gotten married in the States, they didn't have a plan to live in the U.S. permanently. Kathy was planning on heading over to Austria to live with her new husband, and they were going to be reunited for good. And why not? She had raised her children into independent young adults, and they were supportive of her and Johannes' relationship. Everyone who knew Kathy wanted her to be happy, and she truly seemed to be getting there in her marriage with Johannes. Kathy had been unlucky in love before, and this was her shot to have a happy ending. Everything that she dreamed about, her chance to live a full life of love and adventure. And it's no surprise that Johannes fell in love with Kathy. She had a knack for putting people at ease and making them feel special. Perhaps that's why her job as an executive assistant at Sistron Donner suited her so well. Her boss described Kathy as being sincere. And if you are an avid true crime content consumer, which I'm sure you are, then you've probably heard the typical way people describe someone that they have lost. Things like her smile could light up the room or she loved life or to know her was to love her. And I'm sure all of those things are true, but I think because we've heard them so many times before, they become default ways to remember someone in such a traumatic time. But describing someone as sincere, like Gerald did with Kathy, is not heard of that often. And it's a comment which truly reflects Kathy's character. Her boss remembers that she always wanted to know if there was anything she could do to help you. Not because she was trying to just fulfill her job description, but because she genuinely cared about your well-being. However, as great as she was at serving others, everyone needs a break. So every weekday at Sistron around noon, Kathy would take off her heels and put on her walking shoes and head out to walk on a trail, which was close to her workplace. It is perfect. It's called the Contra Costa Canal Trail, and it winds through Concord and other residential neighborhoods for 13 and a half miles. Now, Concord, California, I don't think I've spoke about this area before. It's a city in Contra Costa County. It's located in the East Bay region of San Francisco, and it's a suburb of Oakland. It's 30 miles east of San Francisco, and I mentioned it's about 20 minutes away from where Kathy lived. Now, Sistron was located in a pretty residential area, even though there are businesses and other industrial companies in that vicinity. But as you can see on this map, lots of homes in this area. It's a beautiful city. The weather is great. It's usually in the 80s and sunny. It hardly rains here in California. But of course, today we're expecting a lot of rain from Hurricane Hillary, which is now a tropical storm. It's our first tropical storm warning ever. But Concord is great. It's great for outdoor activities like taking a bike ride, walking, running on the trail. I just mentioned the Contra Costa Canal Trail. And here's Kathy's office. Look at where the trail opening is right here beyond the parking lot. Very convenient. So you know why she liked taking these afternoon lunch breaks where she could just walk. But she also did because this gave her a chance to call her new husband and talk for about an hour and work out at the same time. Johannes was nine hours ahead. So at noon, it would be 9 p.m. his time. It was still early enough to connect with Kathy before heading to bed. So this was their everyday routine. She had just gotten married two months before this to the love of her life. So this distance was hard, but they were truly in love. And this was one of the ways that kept that spark alive. Their daily phone calls, they look forward to them every day. So on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 13th of May, around 12, 40 p.m. Kathy's co-workers watched her as she slipped on her shoes and walked out the door just like she had done so many times before. Now because of the recent case I told you about, Rachel Morin, which is not related, but I've been seeing a lot of comments because of that case being unsolved right now, talking about women walking on trails. And there are different perspectives. Some people will bluntly just say they think walking alone on a trail is unsafe for any woman, but they make sure to emphasize that it is particularly dangerous for an attractive woman or a woman in shape or women who look like Rachel Morin or Kathy, bouncing blonde hair, tanned skin, tight clothing. But then there's another perspective that people take that say women should not have to worry that they're gonna end up dead because they wanted to get some exercise or get out in nature, even if they are alone. And don't you wear fitness clothes to be active? And I see both points. I think because of cases like this one and Rachel's, there's something to be said about being a woman alone on a trail. 
When you think of a trail where a woman's going to be at risk of going missing or being attacked, you might imagine somewhere off the beaten path, and it's at night, and it's a thick forest shrouded in darkness, no homes or people in sight. Somewhere an unsuspecting victim could be dragged away without anyone hearing them scream. But that's not what this trail was like in California, and it's not like the one that Rachel Marin was on in Maryland. These were high traffic areas in daylight, or at the least, it was light out. It was not a night. In this case today, Kathy chose to walk on a well-lit and popular path. At any given time of the day, it was bustling with people. They were riding their bikes, taking their dogs on a walk. And a lot of people live right nearby this trail. You can see the homes right along the path. Here's where Kathy would enter the trail. And here's where the office is in reference. This is similar to what it may have looked like on the day that she went walking. She took the path this way. You can see the small canal on the right, the homes and apartment buildings above on the hill, and other residences on the left. This fateful Tuesday afternoon, the trail was humming with activity. People were on their bikes, like I was saying. They were riding by. They were walking their dogs. And there were people just kind of loitering about, just taking in the sights and the views of the park or just decompressing. But along the trail... There was also a small encampment of people that were experiencing homelessness. While some might turn up their nose at these types of people in our society because they're afraid of the dangers they might bring, generally this section of the trail was considered as safe as the rest of it. This is especially true during the daytime, where we expect sunlight to chase the shadows away. Some of the people that were enjoying the fresh May air that day might have noticed a beautiful woman in work clothes and running shoes walk past them. They might have noticed her wide smile or the way she giggled on the phone when she was talking to her husband. They may have seen her walk past and thought nothing of it. After all, how many times do we walk past strangers without even giving it a second thought? It's so true. You don't think about it until later. But as Kathy was deeply engaged in her conversation with Johannes, all of a sudden, he hears a gasp or a scream, and the phone goes completely dead. He says, what's, what's wrong? Where are you? Are you still there? But there was no response to his questions. And Johannes, of course, confused about what had just happened. Had Kathy fallen? Had her phone dropped on the floor? He tried calling her back over and over and over again. But all he heard was her phone going to voicemail. Johannes didn't know it yet, but he would soon learn, thousands of miles away, that a horrific crime was taking place. It was one that would change his life forever. Eventually, after some time had passed and Kathy didn't pick up, Johannes called her office to alert her coworkers, and by that time that he made contact with them, they were also starting to worry. Kathy followed the same schedule every single day, and she would be back in the office by that time. They had already noticed that she had not returned, so by the time they spoke with Johannes, they were looking all over for her but she was nowhere to be found. They knew there was only one thing left to do. They hung up with Johannes and they called the Concord Police Department. This was around 3 p.m. Sometimes in these cases, there's frustration about how slowly the police department respond to cases of missing people, especially when they are an adult. However, luckily in this case, the police were on the ball. They immediately sent out officers to the trail within minutes of that call coming in and they started to search for the mom of three. Everyone at her work told the officer she would probably be on that trail, and they showed them where she usually walked. While officers went out on foot and motorcycles, a canine unit was dispatched to Kathy's workplace, and that canine was introduced to Kathy's scent from her work shoes. The canine led their handler towards the trail in the same direction she was known to walk. So they knew they were on the right track, but how could she have just vanished in the middle of broad daylight? Led by the trusty noses of their four-legged companions, these police officers searched along the trail in the same direction Kathy had gone. It didn't take long for them to come across something very concerning. There on the trail was what looked to be blood. We're not talking about a light spatter. We're talking about it looked like it had formed a trail. It looked like a mop had been dipped in blood and dragged across the pavement. I have actual crime scene photos, so I'm going to show them to you. You can see the smear right behind the wheel of this motorcycle. It clearly starts on the trail and then curves towards the tree line. So they follow the trail of blood into the surrounding bushes. The officers picked their way through the underbrush until finally, at 3.30 p.m., they found what they had been looking for, evidence of Kathy and her whereabouts. First, 
they see a shoe lying upside down on the fallen leaves and sticks. And to the left, there was a puddle of blood. Then straight ahead, they saw the body of a woman lying lifeless in the dirt. She was down a small incline covered in blood. This was a very bloody scene. Her clothing had been removed. You can see an animal print bra saturated in blood here on the ground. And what looks like black leggings, another shoe, and a jacket in this picture. If you zoom out, you can kind of see a trail of clothing. The right shoe, then a jacket. And then when you go to the right, if you look closely, it looks like that might be a pair of jeans or a jean jacket and a left shoe up there. So it's as though someone was removing the articles one by one as they attacked Kathy. Clearly, this was a sexually motivated crime. That was very obvious to police officers. It was also a very violent crime. When the officers approached, they checked for vital signs, and they found that despite all the odds, Kathy was still alive, but barely. She was just clinging on to life. So they immediately called EMS. The medical personnel got on the scene within minutes, and they started to carry out life-saving efforts. Then they rushed Kathy in a very fragile state by ambulance to the nearby John Merrow Medical Center. Just minutes after she was carried out of those bushes, Kathy was whisked through the halls of that hospital while medical staff worked tirelessly in an attempt to save her life. But after about an hour, she succumbed to her wounds. At 4.54 p.m., Kathleen Aiello Lorak was pronounced dead. Wow, how could this happen? It's so sad and unbelievable. It's clear from the external injuries on her body that whatever happened to her to cause this death had been violent and painful. Her head had been smashed a number of times, too many times for her to be able to survive. Now switching gears, not to confuse anyone, but to go to the attack that just recently happened on 37-year-old mom of five, Rachel Morin, the details of exactly what happened to her have not been released since that case is ongoing, but it is said that she too had been hit in the face until she was unrecognizable. She was also found without her clothes on, right off the Ma Pa Trail, inside of a tunnel off the side. If you have been here a while, you know that I'm a very visual person. I like to talk about locations. I like to know exactly where everything happened. And I wanted to just briefly tell you one of the reasons why, because maybe some of you are like me and can relate. I have what's called aphantasia, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a mental condition where I cannot visualize mental images in my head. So when I close my eyes, I see black. There's nothing there. No matter how hard I try, I can't envision anything. People with aphantasia, they can't see images of what someone's talking about or describing or even something that I'm thinking. And you're diagnosed by going through a series of questions with your eyes closed. And it's pretty simple. You actually close your eyes, try to make a mental picture of something, people and object settings, and usually they tell you to picture a red apple. So you can do it right now. Close your eyes, see the red apple. Then they'll ask you to manipulate the item, change its color, put it somewhere else on the table, picture it on a table. Then you rate how vivid that image is using a five point scale. If you do not have a visual image, you rate your vividness as one. The rating scale is one, no image at all. And that's mine. <laughs> that's all I know. And then there's two, which is dim and vague, Three would be moderately realistic, and then four would be reasonably vivid, and then there are people who can see five, which is perfectly realistic, as vivid as seeing the thing right in front of them, and y'all are blessed. I'm a one, and I only see darkness. So if you've ever wondered why it's so important for me to tell these stories and to explain things in detail, this is one of the reasons. And I thought I would share this with you as you get to know me watching my videos. But for Kathy and Rachel's cases, I wanted to know exactly where these crimes took place. This right here is where I know that Kathy was found. It's in this proximity. Now, it's much more built out now, but here's what it looked like back in 2003 and what it looked like in November of 2009 when I used Google Maps. This is the end of the canal right here, and we're looking at the crime scene pictures. It appears as though this is the area where Kathy was found, and now there are additional fences, as well as a path going down a hill to a neighborhood nearby. It would have been in this vicinity, but of course, it wasn't as built out like I mentioned, so there was a lot more brush and trees providing cover for the person that carried out this attack. Here is a view from down below taken by investigators at the time Kathy was located. That hill, it really helps conceal the area of the trail where Kathy was dragged. The streaks looked like they had been bloody pieces of her hair, 
because they think she was hit over the head, grabbed, and taken. I found a clip from a channel called Biking with David. This is the exact area of the trail where Kathy was found. And of course, this is present day. But I still wanted to give you an example of what it looks like out there. She was walking in this area, which is considered a quieter portion of the trail, but still, to think that she was just pulled into the trees from right off this path is chilling. I estimate it's about right here where she was attacked. Now switching to the modern day and Rachel Morin, I wanted to take a very brief moment to show you something. I actually asked for permission from Jonathan Lee Rich's Investigates. He's following the Rachel Morin case very closely, and he's allowing me to use this footage of the exact area where Rachel was found on the Ma Pa Trail. In his videos, he goes on location, and for someone visual like me, it means so much to be able to see these areas so that I can truly envision what the circumstances were like in these cases. So thank you to Jonathan. And if you're like me and you want to see all the locations of where cases take place, I would suggest checking out his channel. I'll link it in the cards and below. Here is the opening of that trail where Rachel parked and headed out. Now, there is even a criminal investigation flyer about Rachel hanging here on this bulletin board, as well as pictures of her that her friends and loved ones have left on a bunch of trees lining the trail. And I have to say, for a murder having just occurred, I was surprised at how many people were on this trail when Jonathan went out there. Now, it is a lot more dense on the trail Rachel was on than the one that Kathy was on, and Jonathan even commented about the trail and how dense it was. Granted, this was a week or so after Rachel had been found, but the killer is still out there. But there are police on ATVs coming through every couple minutes patrolling so that, you know, people feel safer. But there are even homes on this path just like the one that Kathy was on, people living right nearby. But as you get closer to where Rachel was found, it does get very remote on the path, and there's a canopy of trees above, and it kind of makes the trail darker. And then right off the trail, there is a tunnel, and that is sadly where Rachel was found, beaten, and violated. So I wanted to show you this, because like I said from the beginning, it's so similar in that no one's reported hearing anything in both of these women's cases. They were just snatched right off a trail. But remember, they were hit over the head. So most likely, they were hit from the back, they were ambushed, they didn't see it coming. They had their headphones on, or maybe they're looking at their phones, talking on their phones. But even if they weren't, they would be used to hearing footsteps of people on the trail with them. They wouldn't have known that someone was there to hurt them until it was too late. It was just one hard swing of something heavy, and that could at least disorient them enough to be swiftly carried away, especially if the perpetrator is bigger than them. When Kathy is admitted to the hospital, it's estimated that she was struck on the head no less than 10 times, which caused extreme and extensive damage to her skull. One of these injuries included a 13-inch skull fracture. Now, I've heard that it's more personal when someone disfigures a person like this, or they're brutally hit in the head, that it's up close and it's personal. Well, let's talk about that, and we'll get to it in a moment. But as soon as Kathy was taken to the hospital and before her ultimate demise, investigators had begun working on figuring out who the monster was that had committed this crime. They attempted to preserve the crime scene as much as they could, but it was already too late. The emergency personnel had come there to save Kathy's life. They had rushed into that scene, and unfortunately, they caused contamination. And no one can blame them. They had to do what they had to do to try to save her life. It is different when there are people that come to the scene and someone is already deceased, because you can easily tiptoe around. But in an emergency situation, time is of the essence. The most important thing to medical professionals is to save the person's life without regard for what's going on around them. However, this did make the investigator's job a lot more difficult. With the announcement that Kathy had died from her injuries, the investigation into her attack quickly became a homicide investigation, and Detective Mike Finney from the Concord PD was the lead on the case. Now, right from the outset, the police considered the sheer scale of the brutality that this might indicate a targeted attack. Was Kathy killed by someone she knew. I said I was going to go into that. Was this a crime of passion fueled by some prior altercation or some event? Well, that's one of the first theories in cases like this. That someone who knew these women followed them, knew their routine, had been stalking, watching, waiting, and when they were at their most vulnerable, they attacked. 
Kathy's sister, Serena, was one of the first family members to find out about her death. And it was just unreal. When Serena called her mother, Helga, to tell her what happened to Kathy, that she had been attacked, she's like, okay, let's, let's get down to the hospital right now to see her. And that's when Serena had to break the news that Kathy was gone. And their mother and father were devastated. And of course, her kids, they were just broken. And I can't even begin to imagine the shock and the pain that would come from losing your mom like this without any answers either. And that's what they wanted. They wanted answers. Now, Johannes, he was the one who said he heard Kathy scream. And he was, of course, distraught. No one had any idea who would do something like this. Investigators were out there on the trail right away. There was little physical evidence to be collected from the immediate area where Kathy was found. However, forensic investigators spread out wider into the bushes to see if there were any other relevant evidence that they could use, and they struck gold almost immediately. Within an hour, they came across one of the most important pieces of evidence in any murder investigation, and that is the murder weapon. It turned out to be a piece of rusted fence post. It had been taken from a worn out portion of the trail fence. It was assumed whoever the killer was had broken the piece off or pulled it from the ground not long before the attack. They used something that was there on the trail, not a weapon that they brought along. And this meant they wouldn't have been as suspicious carrying an object that didn't belong there because they didn't have to bring anything. They had used this fence post to strike Kathy over the head repeatedly. At least one of these strikes would have incapacitated her enough for the attacker to drag her into the bushes without being able to put up much of a fight at all. It makes sense that Kathy, being on the phone, would probably not have seen or heard anyone coming up behind her. And the fence post was covered with blood, and it was close to where the puddle of blood was found near Kathy's body. Similarly, it was said that Rachel Morin was killed with a big rock that was also taken from the scene and used in the moment. And that is why I was so shocked at all these similarities. And they keep going. Police also walked bloodhounds through the scene. They hoped that at least some of Kathy's blood had made its way onto the attacker. And whoever that was would have left the scent for the canines to follow. At the same time, investigators started to piece together some very important details about Kathy's life. Most of us know that a significant portion of murders are committed by individuals that are known to the victim. This unsettling trend becomes even more pronounced when the victims are female. Women are far more likely to be killed by their current or their former partners, or a relative, or an acquaintance, than a stranger. So naturally, all murder investigations begin inward. First, you want an understanding of the victim's life and their history, which is their victimology, particularly their romantic relationships. And there were a few elements which stood out in Kathy's case, like the fact that she was a divorcee. Remember that Kathy had split from her ex-husband Jeffrey Lyon in 1997? Well, that wasn't too long before she was brutally murdered. It wasn't an easy divorce either. Could that divorce have caused a rift big enough between both of them that it drove Jeffrey to kill her? Huh. Or maybe the news of Kathy's recent remarriage has sent him into a jealous rage. Either way, they needed to take a look into Jeffrey as their first priority. Meanwhile, people who live, work, and frequent this trail and the Concord area, they were shocked by Kathy's murder. Like, this had to be a very bold killer to do this in the middle of the day in earshot of people living nearby. And Sistron had over 500 employees. Many of them walked the same path every day. So they all gathered together for an emotional staff meeting where they had grief counselors and they were there to help them cope with the shocking news. No one had been scared to walk that path before Kathy was attacked. But now, no one from the workplace was willing to even go near it. And I don't blame them. I would be the same way, and rightfully so. Kathy's boss said that they've had employees walking that trail for years and years. Men, women alone or in pairs. And he said, quote, there's hardly ever a time when you don't see someone else on that trail. And that's what makes this so unbelievable. Most of the people here in Concord, it's our home. You don't think it's going to be unsafe, end quote. But as much as there was information going out, the police were not releasing many details about exactly what happened to Kathy, other than it was a very violent crime and they were offering a $10,000 reward for anyone with information that could lead to an arrest. Their message to the public was the same as the Maryland police in Rachel's recent case. Stay vigilant, 
Don't be distracted by your phone or music being too loud in your headphones. Visit the trail with a buddy. Let people know where you are. Share your route and your location with a loved one. Don't go at night. My grandpa, who was in military intelligence when I was little, would always say to check your six. And this refers to the six o'clock position. It means look behind you or check your tail. Six is a reference to the vulnerable position where an enemy could fire, and the phase originated with World War I pilots who called the rear of the plane the six o'clock position. When a fighter pilot tells his wingman to check six, it means to look behind you to see if there are any threats there so you can avoid them. And it's sad that we have to do this as women, especially when we are alone, but it's become normal to most of us. It didn't take investigators long to find answers to the questions they had about Kathy's ex-husband, Jeffrey Lyon. When they spoke to him, they found out he had a solid alibi for the time of the murder, and there was no indication that their current situation was anything other than amicable. With that, Jeffrey was cleared of suspicion in his ex-wife's murder for now, but as they say, everyone is a suspect until the killer is caught. So if her ex-husband didn't do it, perhaps it was the new man in her life that had committed this awful act. Again, if you listen to true crime stories before or you're following the Rachel Morin case, then you know that the husband or boyfriend is guilty a lot of the time. And just like Kathy, Rachel had a new man in her life. They had just announced a relationship on Facebook days before her murder. And Kathy was a newlywed who just tied the knot with Johannes. That's where investigators are focusing on Johannes. Maybe he was like the Scott Petersons or the Chris Watts of the world, a man that didn't want to be married anymore but would rather see his wife in a casket than face her in divorce court. I will never understand it, but a lot of times it's financial. These men don't want to split their money with their ex-wife or pay child support, and other times it could even be life insurance. But maybe right now you're thinking that the chances of Johannes murdering his wife are pretty slim because the man was miles away on a different continent and on the phone with her at the time she was attacked. However, think of it this way. He knew her schedule better than anyone else. He knew exactly where she would be and at what time. So could he have something to do with her murder? Could it have been a life insurance payout or some other financial motive that Johannes may have had to hire someone to get rid of Kathy? Maybe he had made sure to be on the phone with her when she was murdered so that he could have a rock solid alibi. Who better to vouch for you than the victim herself being on the phone with you? Her phone records would show they were talking. That's pretty smart. But when officers looked at this angle, they very quickly realized that Johannes was not very likely the one behind this murder. First of all, the weapon indicated that this attack had been one of opportunity rather than pre-planned. They thought if Johannes had planned to have his wife killed, then they probably would have used a more sophisticated weapon. Maybe they would be more of a sniper. They wouldn't want it to be able to be detected. They wouldn't have left the item at the scene. And after speaking with officers, it was clear that Johannes was a grieving widower. He had heard the last moments of Kathy's life, and he wasn't there to be able to protect her. It's unimaginable to think of the pain that Johannes must have felt in that moment, to know that you're just months away from being together. And two months ago, you swore to love and protect them for the rest of their life. And when they needed you the most, you were so far away that you couldn't be there to help. Even though they just scratched off the two most likely suspects from their list, investigators were not discouraged. After just a couple of hours of the crime scene, they realized that a key piece of evidence was missing. If Kathy had been on the phone with her husband when she was attacked, then where was her phone? Could the killer have taken it? If they did, then they most likely would be able to track that phone down and it would lead them to the killer. The police used GPS and they immediately got a hit. It turns out the phone was on and it was pinging from an apartment complex very close to where Kathy was found. Wow. Technology, it's making it so much easier to make these connections. This would not have been possible even like five or 10 years before this in 2003. The investigators thought that they were about to march into this apartment and arrest their killer. And maybe they anticipated wrapping this case up in record time and finishing off their shift for the night. They may have felt feelings of relief that they would provide swift justice to Kathy's family. If any of those thoughts had crossed their minds, they should have known that nothing is ever that simple, especially when it comes to murder. This apartment complex was just a short five-minute drive from the trail. It's right here on Frisbee Court. So they get a search warrant to go into this apartment building 
and it doesn't take long for them to locate the person that's in possession of Kathy's phone. He's 23-year-old Juan Sanchez, and he's got some explaining to do. They may be standing right in front of their killer. But he tells police that when he was riding his bike along the path that afternoon, he came across a phone. No one was there to claim it. He looked around and just figured, you know what? It's free for the taking. And this wasn't an iPhone. This was before iPhones. This was a flip phone, but a phone is a phone. And he felt like finders keepers unless someone called looking for it. But this was worse because the police had come knocking on his door. They want to know the location that he found the phone. So he takes them to the exact spot. It was very close to where Kathy's body was found, only 50 feet away. So this is another piece of their puzzle. Police listened to the story and sure, it sounded plausible. However, they weren't gonna just take it at face value. They asked him to submit a DNA sample. DNA is set to play a massive role in this case, just to let you know, and it usually does. But during the attack, Kathy had been sexually violated, and after her death, swabs had been taken from her body for sampling. The officer didn't know it yet, but the killer had left their DNA on her body. Getting a sample from the guy that had her phone would be a surefire way to either implicate him or exonerate him from their list of suspects. But this isn't a fast process. It takes weeks for these DNA tests to be run, and it's still the very same day that Kathy went missing and was found dead. They made progress, but they still have to keep an eye on Juan in case it turns out that he's their man. There are a lot of possibilities in this case. So many different access points where someone could have entered this trail and been waiting for Kathy or another unsuspecting woman to walk by so that they could fulfill their evil desires. And as I mentioned, there were a lot of concerns about transient individuals without homes using portions of this trail as a place to live. Could one of them have become desperate and attacked Kathy. Unfortunately, when the crime lab tried to pull fingerprints off of the murder weapon, there were none found. At her autopsy, the manner of death was, of course, homicide, and the cause was blunt force trauma to her head. During that autopsy, they take swabs from inside and on her body. Seminal fluid was present. We know what that means. So while investigators were out doing groundwork, lab techs were running the DNA profile they take from Kathy's body through their database, a database that at the time had about six million other samples recorded. Everyone was hoping that a name would pop up, but once again, their efforts to quickly close this case did not amount to much. There were no matches. So they're back at square one. And I'm continuing to mention Rachel Morin because coincidentally, they found DNA in her body, but police haven't released what source it was. Was it semen? Was it skin underneath her fingernails? We don't know. But they too ran it in CODIS, and guess what? They did get a match. However, they didn't get a name. Instead, they got an unknown assailant match, which means that the same DNA has been found on another unsolved case, but the perpetrator had not committed a crime or been caught for a felony where the DNA would have been put in the system. Therefore, they know the two cases are connected, but they don't have a name. And I explained that in the beginning, but that's just crazy. And this just happened a few days ago. But in Kathy's case, there were no hits not even to other crimes, nothing. So for it being so violent, it's hard to believe that a person did not have a record, which again made them believe this is probably someone she knew. Plus, when the DNA of the guy with the phone, Juan Sanchez, was run against the unknown DNA taken from Kathy, it was not a match. So he was telling the truth. He just found her phone, and he wasn't the killer. As the days went on and the case remained unsolved, the town grew more and more frightened that they had a madman on the loose. If such a gruesome murder could happen in broad daylight in a town like Concord, California, then was anyone ever gonna be truly safe? There's always a sense of violation that's felt by a community when cases like this one occur, and even more so when the murder happens on a public path in the middle of the day. It was just one more location to add to a long list of places in the world where women don't feel safe. We're told those things like don't walk alone, don't walk at night, make sure to go on a heavily traveled path. Well, Kathy was following all those rules. She should have been safe, but she wasn't. I mean, how many of us have felt safer by jumping on the phone with someone, especially our significant other? And to think that that doesn't even deter a killer, it's scary. As detectives continue to look back through Kathy's life for signs of something off, they started to realize that she had drawn the attention of a couple different people and not through any fault of her own. Kathy was an incredibly beautiful, vivacious woman, and she had a zest for life. So it would be no surprise if she had some admirers who took their obsession too far. 
One person that came up was an ex-boyfriend who was actually from Germany but happened to be in town the day Kathy was murdered. In fact, she had met up with him a few days before she was killed. Who knows what this was in regard to? Was she closing the door to that relationship because she just got married? Could she have told him about her recent nuptials and it caused him to fly into this murderous rage? After all, it wouldn't be the first time someone has killed because of love and jealousy. It happens all the time. So detectives look into this ex-boyfriend and they have a chat about his whereabouts during the attack. But no matter how they looked at him, they couldn't quite connect him to the scene or to the murder. So what does a seasoned detective do when every single lead falls through? They go back to good old detective work, hitting the streets, talking to anyone who may have heard or seen something that day. On the day of the murder and in the days following, officers had walked that trail back and forth, 13 and a half miles, speaking to witnesses. They also made public appeals for anyone who was walking on the trail that day to get in touch with investigators, and numerous witnesses came forward saying, you know what? I saw a sketchy-looking guy on the trail that day. He was acting kind of strange. He was gesturing to the canal and to the bushes as if he was trying to draw people's attention to that area. One person said he was like calling out fish in the pond and telling someone that was walking by to come look. So could Kathy have stopped in response to the stranger and been attacked? She was a nice person. Maybe they did say something to her that made her care enough about what they were pointing out that she was lured into letting her guard down. So these witnesses worked with the sketch artist, Gil Zamora from the Concord PD, and they come up with two composite sketches of the guy that was seen that day. And both of these sketches seem to show the same guy, except in one, he's wearing sunglasses on top of his head, but they look so very similar. Here they are, left and right. And they got these from different people. So they made these sketches separate and they still look the same. So they're thinking this has to be him. They released the sketches to the public alongside another appeal for information. Off the back of that, there were hundreds of calls that came into the team. Everything from people claiming that they knew exactly who this man was to they saw him acting strangely on the trail the day of the murder. It's important to note that there was an even bigger reward being offered for any information that would lead to the arrest of Kathy's murderer. Remember how Johannes's father worked at Sistron, and of course, Kathy had worked there too for the last two years? Well, Sistron decided they wanted to help. So they offered a $25,000 reward, and coupled with the $10,000 from the police department, this could look like a pretty big uh, payday for anyone with information. Police also held a press conference, and Kathy's eldest son, 26-year-old Mike, spoke. He asked the public for help and described his mother as adventurous, spontaneous, and comfortable in any situation. He said, quote, She was so full of life. She had an infectious smile and a twinkle in her eye. She made friends everywhere she went, and we will always have her in our hearts, and we know she's looking after us, end quote. Police went on to inform the public about the characteristics of the man they were looking for in these sketches. He was described as between 25 and 40 years old. That is quite a range right there, but he had a round face. And he was between 5'10 and 6 feet tall, 180 to 200 pounds, medium build with a pronounced stomach. That sounds pretty average. He was also said to have medium length hair, brown in color. He was clean shaven and was seen wearing docker style khaki pants, a light colored t-shirt or polo shirt with a dark colored zip up sweatshirt and brown sunglasses. They were still not sure whether this was a targeted or random act, but they did believe it was an isolated incident. And I was thinking, how though? How would you be thinking it's isolated if you don't even know who did it? I don't know. And of course the leads flooded in. They got over 200 tips. So police took a closer look at the sketches and compared them to mugshots of local men that had had recent or any clear incidents of violence. And the more they looked, the more they realized that they think they knew who this guy was. A man who was in that area on a regular basis, and he had definitely been on that trail before. This was a face of a man who was not a stranger to the inside of a jail cell either. In fact, police had arrested him on multiple occasions for minor offenses, but still, there was one recent arrest that had been for attacking a judge in court as he was being tried for one of his charges. This public altercation indicated a clear escalation in the level of violence in his offenses. The officers knew who he was, John Kaler, and they all agreed the guy in the pictures looked like him. John Henry Kaler was a 32-year-old mechanic 
who was suffering from some mental illness. And that had led to a number of altercations with police. He suffered from bipolar disorder and a form of schizophrenia. And this was touted as the reason for his strange behavior. The thing is, John only lived just three quarters of a mile away from the trail where Kathy was found. And on top of that, when the police had walked the bloodhounds through this crime scene, they had led them straight to the street where John lives. If you put all this together, it makes sense that this is the guy. It isn't that uncommon. Someone becomes unhinged, they take out their aggression or their desires on an innocent person who just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. So after tracking down lead after lead, the police finally identified their guy. And they even called Kathy's family to let them know of the recent developments. Kathy's son, Eric, said that while his apprehension would have in no way made up for the death of his mom, bringing the killer to justice would help provide some sense of closure. He said that it would have been much more painful if their family had to keep going on knowing that the person who did this to their loved one was still out there walking free. Detective Finney had called Eric and Mike, Kathy's sons, and let them know who their prime suspect was. Eric was in the car with his grandma, Kathy's mom, and he turned to her and he just said, they got him. I mean, look how similar he looks to that sketch. So once police are sure that they have accurately identified the man in the sketches, they organize a task force to approach John's father's house where John lives. This was just 72 hours after Kathy was murdered. It was Friday, May 16th, and they were knocking on the door of where they believe Kathy's killer lives. After a couple of knocks, the door inched open slowly. But standing in front of them was not the man from the sketches. Instead, it's a woman's fearful face peering out from behind this door. So the police quickly explain that they're there looking for John Kaler and that they had reason to believe he lived at this property. The woman explained that they were kind of on the right track. She identified herself as John's 35-year-old sister, Elizabeth, and she agreed that John used to live there. But she told them, you can't talk to John because he's not home, and he never will be. Had they had come around just a couple days earlier, they could have probably spoken to her brother. But now, John was dead. What? This case just keeps getting more interesting and shocking because it turns out on May 14th, just a day after Kathy was found beaten to death, John made his way to the Golden Gate Bridge around noon and jumped off. He landed on the ground near Fort Point in San Francisco, right in this area underneath the bridge. I was shocked to hear this. The officers were stunned too. This is their prime suspect in a brutal murder. And this man took his life just one day after the crime. They thought, this is no coincidence. How could it be? He was on the trail, according to witnesses. He had issues in the recent past, and then he would have a reason to end his life if there was a connection here. It made sense to police. As they conducted a walkthrough of this home where John had lived before his death, they were even more convinced they had found their killer. Sitting in a pile of stuff that they were told belonged to John was a pair of sunglasses. When they compared those glasses to the ones that the witnesses had claimed the man was wearing and that were in that sketch, they realized that they looked exactly the same. I'm showing them to you here. Here's the room. Here's where they found the sunglasses, and there they are. Not only that, look at this. They found clothing that looked like it had blood on it. But what was even more telling was that they find a newspaper article about Kathy's murder within John's possessions. The article included the sketches that led police right to John's door. And it seemed clear that John had committed this crime. And then he realized the police were on his track and he decided to jump off the bridge rather than face the consequences of his actions. That's a really drastic way to go. And it's a very common one. That bridge is known for things like this to happen. So police thought that this made sense, that he chose this way out because of his previous charges and then this murder. However, John's family, who were still in the middle of grieving his death, were not convinced. John's father, David, said that, yes, his son had mental health issues, but that was no reason to link him to the crime. He said, quote, to take these four or five coincidental facts and link them together and make so much out of it, I think, is irresponsible. As far as tarnishing the reputation of a young man that has already had a tarnished reputation is unthinkable and unconscionable, end quote. 
His family was not happy. John wasn't there to defend himself, and considering their grief, it's understandable that they would be upset and they wanted to stand up for him. Well, there's one way to rule him out. DNA. And they conveniently have John's body at the morgue. If he's not their guy, they will know soon enough. However, even though they want to be sensitive with John's family, when they're back at the station, several eyewitnesses were shown a photo lineup that included a picture of John, and they pick him out as the man that was acting strange on the trail the same day Kathy was killed. At this point, they were pretty much running John's DNA as a formality, just as another administrative step in this murder investigation that they feel like they've already solved. I say that because the police released John's name to the media. Newspapers were running headlines with ones like this, mentally ill man, focus of probe. And there was even a map on the front page showing where John lived. And it didn't take long for a bunch of media outlets to grab onto the story. And the news vans were up and down John's family's suburban street. But David, he kept professing his son's innocence. However, police still had that search warrant and they took John's car, they took David's computer, and they even took a washing machine from the premises to aid in this investigation. David even told them, I'll take a polygraph, my son didn't do this. And he passed, saying he knew his son was home during the time frame that police say that Kathy went out on that trail. John's father was a member of the Contra Costa chapter of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And he came down hard and criticized the Concord Police Department for confirming that his son was the focus of their investigation before they even got the DNA results back. But on the other hand, they wanted to make the public aware of the risk or lack thereof. So they were weighing all of those things when they released his name. They had John's background in mind. To think that he had been arrested four times in the past 10 years for drunk driving to the attack on the judge on November 15th, 1997. I mean, this man was handcuffed in custody and he became angry when he was talking to his lawyer about his plea deal. A sheriff's deputy in that courtroom that day said he heard John yell, quote, I'm gonna kill him. That mother effer is going to die, end quote. And this was being said as the Superior Court Judge William Cullen walked into the room. And then John jumped towards him and attempted to put his hands around his neck or put his handcuffs around him to choke him. But that deputy tackled him, preventing him from doing that. This wasn't the first time that John's dad came to his defense. Throughout the 90s, when John was getting in trouble, David and other family members wrote letters to the court saying that John's condition was treatable and that, quote, he has a family here in Concord, able and willing to support him, and he has a good job to challenge him, end quote. But John didn't stay out of trouble. He only got into more of it. More letters from David were sent to the court begging them to take him into custody and help his son. David wanted them to give him mental health treatment. He even offered to pay for them to commit him to a psychiatric hospital, saying, quote, Without something like this, John may spend years in the system at great expense and suffering ever increasingly psychiatric damage to himself, end quote. So ultimately, judges did give orders for John to get treatment as a condition of his probation, but court records show he would never stay at any of these inpatient programs. He would just check himself out. The waiting game was hard on everyone, but they had no choice. They had to see if John's DNA matched. Meanwhile, Kathy was laid to rest May 21st, 2003 at Holy Cross Cemetery with a service at 11 a.m. at Holy Rosary Church in Antioch. Weeks were going by. There were no updates to provide, no other leads coming in. They were just waiting to confirm John's DNA. And a month later, that day finally came. The results revealed that John Kaler's DNA was not a match for the DNA found on Kathy's body. John was not their killer, and that is unreal. Yet the media, remember the media, they had ran so many stories that seemed to confirm he was their man. And I see this so much nowadays. With the Brian Koberger trial, for instance, there are full-on shows implicating this man without a trial being carried out. And whatever the outcome is, you're still innocent until proven guilty. So I think it's a slippery slope announcing things before they're truly confirmed. And of course, John's family wants an apology. And this revelation was a huge blow to investigators. They had been so confident that this was their man. Their decision to release his name to the public before those DNA results were in only served one purpose. It just further traumatized John's family while they were grieving his death. 
David said, quote, they shouldn't be releasing half facts, half truths, and undeveloped evidence, end quote. He told the media he was pursuing new legislation that would protect families and persons of interest in criminal cases. He made note that even though the DNA results did not show a genetic match, police were not out there publicly ruling out his son. It was only after David went on TV himself to announce it that authorities finally came out and said there was no match. However, they were still calling John Kaler a person of interest. By June 12th, newspapers were reporting that the DNA test failed to confirm John was linked to Kathy's murder. One article read, Preliminary results examined by the crime lab did not match any samples given to the lab to compare, including one they got directly from John's deceased remains. However, the police stated, We are not able to conclusively include or exclude any individual from this investigation, end quote. So they're just covering their bases. But was John's self-inflicted death really just a coincidence? If he didn't kill Kathy, maybe he came across her body. Or maybe he witnessed the attack. Perhaps... That guilt just ate at him until he felt like he had no choice but to end his life. No one really knows what happens during those last hours of John's life. However, it is a bitter consolation for his family to know for certain that he's not a murderer. The investigators were back at zero, and in a bold move, John Kaler's family, they offer their own $5,000 reward to anyone with information about Kathy's case that can lead to arrest because they wanted to offer this money, hoping that would lead to information that would clear their son once and for all. I don't blame them, and it's a very generous act as well. But what would really clear his name was finding someone else. And there just wasn't anyone. But the police kept on fighting to get justice for Kathy and her family. They took DNA samples from at least 50 different men, and still there were no connections. They were interviewing people every single day. Then finally, four months after Kathy's murder, they get a break. It's September at the time, and they had spoken to a witness back in the early days when the case was unfolding. They talked to this man about nine days after the murder, and he had told them that he was on the trail that day, and he talked to a man while he was riding by on his bike. He stopped, he had a chat, and they smoked a cigarette together. So this was nine days after, and he offers to take the police to the exact spot where he had been standing. It was only 200 feet away from where Kathy was found. And when the police arrived at the location, they're looking around for clues. And keep in mind, I keep saying this, but like a week after Kathy's murder, the prospect of any reliable evidence was slim to none. But they looked down and on the pavement, they saw two cigarette butts exactly where this man said they would be. And he's like, that's probably them. Now they definitely were not in pristine condition, but this is all they had. So they took the cigarette butts in for testing and they were not hopeful because there had been sun, there had been rain and dirt. They didn't think they were going to have any evidence on them, much less a reliable DNA profile. But they had these tests sent in. They are just now getting the test back four months later. They're getting that DNA back to see if anything transpired from it, right? The cigarette butts held a full DNA profile. So right away, they ordered that profile to be compared to the DNA taken from Kathy's body. Another waiting game, but this is all they have. More and more time was going by, and they really wanted to be able to either move on or look further into the right person. So those four months, they had to wait, and they finally get those results. The DNA on the cigarette butts were a match to the DNA on Kathy. The man that shared that cigarette with that witness was the man who killed Kathy. But it was so frustrating because there was a problem. So they know they have the DNA of the killer and they know it's a man, but they have no idea who he is. And that would be so hard to deal with because you know he exists, but you have almost nothing to find him except to go back to the witness and ask, do you remember anything specific about this man? Anything at all? The witness is racking his brain, trying to remember anything that stood out. And he says something that the killer had told him he worked at a telemarketing company in Walnut Creek. Well, Walnut Creek is only 13 minutes away from the crime scene. So police look into that lead and they realize there's only one telemarketing company operating in that area called Creative Marketing Inc. So they visit their offices and they're armed with the composite sketches. Remember those? Because that's all they had. They didn't know if this was John Kaler and he happened to be on the trail and that's who the sketch was or if they actually had a sketch of the killer. 
workers at the company say they immediately recognize the face in those sketches as belonging to one of their coworkers, a 38-year-old man named Robert Ward Frazier. Finally, after months of running around in circles, it seems like something is falling into place. But his manager tells them, Robert, he stopped coming into work in May, less than a week after Kathy's body was found. Wow. This is another one of those leads with something that seems so much more than just a coincidence. So detectives are provided with Robert's last known address. And when they knock on the door, once again, not greeted by a man, they're greeted by a woman who says she is his ex-girlfriend. Just like his manager had said, she told him Robert skipped town a while ago. She thought that maybe he could be back in the Midwest because that's where he's from, but she didn't know for sure. Before they leave the house, they ask Robert's ex-girlfriend for anything that might still have his DNA on it, and she gives them his toothbrush, and that is perfect. But you know the drill. It would take weeks before a DNA profile or potential match would come back, and in the meantime, the police headed off to try to find their man. They ran his information, and they find out there's a warrant out for his arrest, and it's all the way in Lake County, Indiana. Here's that information. It says he's white, he's 5'11", he's 190 pounds. Sounds just like that eyewitness description of the man acting strange on the trail. His hair is also medium in length in this picture. It says his residence is at 12920 Knight Street in Cedar Lake, Indiana, and that he has had nine arrests and has a tattoo of a dragon on his upper left arm. But does he resemble the sketches? I don't know. Similar, yes, maybe, I'm not sure. But either way, they call over to Lake City and they couldn't believe their luck when they discovered that Robert had been arrested on unrelated charges when he tried to come back into Indiana. That's where he was living before making his way out to California. He was apparently on probation before he left because of battery and a drug-related charge. So they put out a warrant for his arrest when he didn't show up for his scheduled probation check-ins. Even better, he was still in their custody. He had been pulled over on a traffic infraction when he got back in town. Well, the Concord detectives didn't waste any time. That afternoon, the detectives flew over there to chat with Robert. Now take a look at this man. What are your initial thoughts? Mine were, wow, he's big. Or he, he looks big in this video, and I do have some footage from this interview to show you. So police sat down with their suspect, and actually, he's completely unfazed by their questions. He is very relaxed. Look at his demeanor here. He's got his leg up. He's leaning on the table. He's smiling. He even cracked jokes and lounged in his chair as if he didn't have a care in the world. This doesn't look like a man concerned about being connected to a murder. He's shaking Detective Finney's hand. No problem. They ask him the places he's lived before, and he mentions that he used to live in Tinley Park, Illinois, and before that, Chicago. I used to live in Tinley Park, Illinois. And before that, Chicago. And when they ask him if he owns a pair of sunglasses, he is laughing at his own joke. He's like, okay, yeah, I had sunglasses. I lived in California. Bingo. They already know that. They already know that he was in Walnut Creek, but they wanted to hear him say he lived in California and coming out of his own mouth. <laughs> yeah, okay, I had sunglasses. I lived in California, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Once they confirmed he lived close by the area where Kathy was found murdered, they asked him, did you hear about Kathy's murder when you were back working in California? And he actually admitted that he did see something about it on TV. After that, they tell him that someone saw him on the trail and that he matched their sketches. And then he skipped town after her murder. So he admits something. He said, yeah, I smoked a couple cigarettes with some guy. So they ask him how long he thinks he was out there during that time frame, which by the way, is the time frame that Kathy was there. And he said, well, talking to that guy on the trail, hmm, about a half hour or so, maybe like 30 minutes at least. The witness had said it was a quick chat. Nevertheless, Robert has admitted to being on the same trail at the same time Kathy was there and he smoked cigarettes. Two things that match up. I smoked a couple cigarettes with them. I think they were Marlboros. Okay. Okay. So, so how long do you think you were up there around that time frame? Well, talking to him, I must have talked to him for like a half hour or, uh, or more. But then they ask him if he remembered what Kathy looked like, if he could remember seeing her picture on TV. And he said he did remember. 
He said she had long hair. It looked like it could have been brown. And he formed it as a question, kind of waiting for them to confirm. But then he said that she had freckles. Well, all the pictures that I've shown you don't show any freckles on Kathy's face. But what's shocking to detectives is that Kathy does have freckles, but only someone that is intimately involved with her would know because they are on her chest between her boobs. None of the pictures shown in the media show any of these freckles, yet this man knows she has them, and that is so creepy. Listen to him. Have you ever seen her picture on TV? Yeah. What, what does she look like? She had long hair. It looked like it was brown. Freckles. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's what she looked like. He guesses that's what she looked like? Well, it's a good guess, isn't it? The only way Robert would have known this information is if he would have seen Kathy bare-chested recently, which is just disgusting and chilling. When detectives hear about the freckles, they're pretty certain that Robert is their man. What he doesn't know is that they already have 100% confirmation that he was there at least 200 feet from where Kathy was found because they've got his DNA on that cigarette. When they tell him this fact, he admits it again. Yeah, I, I know I was out there, but I didn't do this murder. And he's smiling as he says no. Uh, okay, I was out there. I didn't do this murder, though. You're saying you didn't do the whole. So one of the detectives is like, did you happen to see anyone commit this crime? Remember, they don't have the results back from comparing the DNA on the toothbrush to the DNA found on Kathy's body. They're still probing. What if he saw John Kaler on the trail, for instance? But Robert says no, that he didn't see anyone do it either. So they keep going, asking him if he has any idea who would have done this. What he says is interesting. He tells them, no, I don't even have any idea why someone would do something like this. And at that point, they had only told him about her being murdered. You didn't see anybody who committed this crime? No, I didn't see it either. Okay. You have no idea who would have done this? No, I don't even have any idea why someone would do something like that. And he acted like he was stunned that someone would be so evil. Then they add that she was forced in intercourse as well, and he seems even more shocked. He's like, this lady was raped. And Detective Finney confirms by saying yes, to which Robert replies in a seemingly concerned manner, quote, oh, well, now I know I didn't do it. And then he laughs nervously and says, I know I didn't do it before. Well, good catch. No, I know I didn't do that. <laughs> I knew I didn't do it before, but okay. He acted like he would never do such a thing, almost faking empathy because it definitely seemed fake. His body language wasn't adding up. And that's when detectives reveal that they have DNA that they collected from the crime scene and it was on her body and the murder weapon. Robert seems to have a reason why his DNA might be there. He was like, well, you know what? I had to take a pee when I was on the trail. And he's like, I took a whiz out in the bushes. So that's about it. So what this guy is trying to say is that he inadvertently gave the victim a golden shower. And that's why his DNA was on her. He just happened to accidentally pick the exact spot that a killer had not only violated her, but sodomized her. We're talking, took his time to force her to do the most unspeakably invasive and violating acts before taking her life in such a horrific manner. But he claims, no, I'm not the guy that did that. I just had a full bladder, and I picked the wrong spot to relieve myself. I took a whiz out in the, in the bushes um, nearby uh, that thing. Mm -hmm. That's about it. <laughs> Detectives are not buying it. It didn't make any sense. Urine is not semen. So they ask him, well, what bushes was it that you peed in? And he says, oh, um, there were bushes near where there's a hole in the fence, and that he went down there to the same place where he admits they showed on television as being the crime scene. Wow. He says, oh, I didn't want to mention it until now because he didn't want to place himself near a murder scene for just innocently peeing. So then they ask him, well, did you see anyone else down there? And he said, no. So he's not even trying to implicate anyone else. He's literally describing the area where Kathy's body had been dragged before she was killed. It's just too much. That's the only thing that can place me anywhere near which bushes? Which bushes? Well, it was bushes right near uh, 
there was a hole in the fence and I went down there just like it showed on that thing on TV and that's why I didn't mention that until now, but I did. Down there. Anybody, did you see anybody down there? No. But they're still not getting him to confess. So Finney has an idea. He decides to use shock value. He looks for one of the worst pictures of Kathy from that crime scene and he slaps it down on the table in front of Robert while using a very aggressive tone and he says, quote, what did she do? to make you do that, end quote. And Robert looks at it for a second, and he says, oh my God, I don't want to see that. Finney is like, yeah, I know you don't, as if he doesn't want to face what he did. And Finney repeats it. He's like, what did she have to do to make you do that? And Robert's like, I didn't do that. And I mean, he does kind of sound convincing. What did she do to you to make you do that? Oh my God, I don't want to see that. I know you don't. What did she do to make you want to do that? I didn't do that. If you were innocent, how would you sound? He hands the picture back to the detective and he says he has nothing to do with that. He says, I didn't rape or murder anyone and I'm staying to that. And as far as anything else goes, I mean, any further questions after this is going to have to go through a lawyer because this is getting too scary. It is scary. They know that he's their man. They know he killed Kathy. I'm staying to that. As far as any other things go, I mean, any further questions after this I have to go through a lawyer because this is getting too scary. Well, until he gets that lawyer, he is under arrest. Detective Finney tells him that. But you know what? He's already been locked up, so he kind of scoffs like, duh, that's how you found me. But Finney says, Robert, I have a warrant here for your arrest from the state of California. And Robert butts in. He's like, I already have one. But Finney interrupts and says, it's for capital murder. And that's when Robert kind of backs out and just goes, all right. They also show him a search warrant for his blood from the state of Indiana. And he's still laughing. He's like, okay, go look for it. Search warrant for the blood from the state of Indiana. All right, go look for it. They send in a nurse to take two vials from him right there in that small interrogation room. Now, they have concrete DNA evidence from him. And when that is tested against the toothbrush and the cigarette butts, it's a match. Robert was Kathy's killer. And he was charged with forced intercourse, sodomy, and first-degree murder. The death penalty was on the table. He was facing death or life in prison without the possibility of parole. May 2006, he stands trial. Deputy District Attorney John Cope is the prosecutor. And the defense attorney is Eric Quant. Kathy's family was in the courtroom. And Robert wasn't showing any emotions. He was just sitting there, listening to the prosecutor's opening statement. The attorney talks about how Kathy was struck with an amazing amount of force. She was thrashing around, her fists were clenched, and there was large pools of blood, and it was on her face, and her hair was matted with blood. There were many pictures displayed for the jury. One was of this metal fence rod. The prosecutor said, quote, this bar has the defendant's DNA on the handle, end quote. And he told the jury that the victim can't speak, so the evidence will speak for her. They presented witnesses who saw Robert on that trail. He was the one trying to distract people by pointing into things in the canal. The canal right near where Kathy was pulled into the bushes. One witness said that Robert was talking about tadpoles. Another said he was making comments about employee badges. And they also heard from the man who smoked a cigarette with him. Can you imagine if he hadn't told that man that he worked as a telemarketer? If he hadn't spoken up they may not have been able to find Robert at all. The prosecution believes that he came there looking for his sexual desires to be met. He saw Kathy walking down that trail on her phone and he chose her because there was probably no one coming in either direction on the path at that time and she was distracted. By that time, he had already grabbed the metal fence rod and he was waiting for the right moment, hiding in those bushes when he struck her with great force. So much so her head split open and she began bleeding as she fell to the ground. Then he quickly grabbed her legs and dragged her from the trail down into the ravine where he violated her. He had his way with her in every way he could before striking her a number of times in the head until her skull cracked. Then he left her there to die. Well, Robert's defense attorney wanted to point out to the jurors that they would be seeing a number of graphic photos, but that they shouldn't let their emotions cloud their judgment. And that there's no way that the prosecutors would be able to prove the charges of forced intercourse and sodomy because the victim's body showed no signs of bruising. Um, 
there was semen in places, you know, but yeah, good argument, I guess. Nice try. The trial lasted a whole month. The defense's argument was that Robert was homeless at the time, and he was just walking on the trail like everyone else until he heard Kathy's rude comments about the homeless problem in that area. And that's when Robert became enraged. And in an instant, he just went off and snapped. He said, this crime is a rash, impulsive, unplanned, and unsophisticated attack, and that it wasn't premeditated. He was hoping to get Robert a lesser sentence. Since he knew he couldn't deny his DNA was there, but sir, semen, that's all I'm gonna say. The prosecution made their closing argument saying that Kathy would never be here to tell how much she begged or how much she cried. And honestly, I think about those last moments. Did she say something like, I'm a mom, please don't kill me? Or was she even conscious after the attack? We will never know. The defense admitted that Robert attacked her on that trail, but that he only did it out of rage, that he didn't go there to hurt anyone. Look, he had conversations, civilized conversations with other people. He only dragged her away to conceal her, not to violate her. It was only after he got her down there that he decided to go further and do those other actions. He said it's reasonable to believe that the sex happened second. And he said this to try to get the death penalty taken off the table, saying that it wasn't a planned attack. Wouldn't that be necrophilia? The jury was left to deliberate. It took the eight-woman, four-man jury less than a day to come up with a verdict. Guilty on all accounts. But now, they had to decide his sentence. Would it be life or death? Kathy's son, Eric, thanked the judge and the jury. He said, we're so happy for this outcome. Although nothing will bring their mom back, it could relax a little knowing that this person was gonna be behind bars, but she was going to be missed and they loved her so much. All 42-year-old Robert Frazier did was rest his head in his hands. As the verdict was read, he did not show any emotions. When the time came for Robert to be sentenced for his horrific crime, his defense team provided some insight into his childhood. They were attempting to reduce his culpability. Not much is known about Robert's early years. However, it was revealed that he was a child of two teenage parents. And apparently, when he was young, he was the victim of physical, emotional, and sexual incidents himself. He eventually started to use drugs, and allegedly he was addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol and dabbled with sniffing gasoline to get high. His defense team also revealed that he had multiple mental ailments, including organic brain dysfunction, attention deficit disorder, and bipolar. But the defense attorney said, he's not the worst of the worst. He's just mentally ill. Um, I'd have to say he's pretty bad. He's one of the worst. But the prosecutor urged the judge to choose death for Robert, saying, quote, frankly, he's earned it, end quote, and I agree. Ultimately, the story of Robert's traumatic childhood was not enough to negate how gruesome and senseless Kathy's murder was. He was sentenced to the harshest punishment possible in America, which is death. After the sentencing was read by the judge, Robert went off on the prosecution. He said that nothing he told the jurors reflected truth whatsoever, and he went on to complain about all the negative stories about him in the media saying that they were biased. He said, now I'm expected to show remorse for crimes that I didn't commit. And he warned the judge not to send an innocent man to death row. The jurors hugged Kathy's family after the sentence came down. They recommended death and they got it. Kathy's brother, William, said that they were satisfied with the verdict, but the justice wasn't truly served until Robert was dead. And William was trying not to lose it because sadly, Kathy's dad had just died just before sentencing. And William said that he died of a broken heart. He was 84 years old. And that would be a lot for anyone, but a father at that age, it was just too much. William did thank the prosecution saying that you will never know how much you did for his family. Robert is on death row in San Quentin. And this story is truly the stuff of nightmares. It's terrifying that we live in a world where a woman cannot go out in the middle of the day on a busy walking trail without the fear of getting violated and violently killed for her body so that a man can have a few minutes of pleasure in exchange for a lifetime of pain for her loved ones. This horrific crime occurred two decades ago, and it's sad to think that in many ways nothing has changed. Women still live in fear of the shadows in the woods, and women like Rachel Moran, the mom of five, 
had just succumbed to the same fate as Kathy did this month. I hope they find the person that did that to her so they can bring justice like they have for Kathy's family. I thank all of you for being here with me today. Thank you so much for giving Kathy's family your time and your attention. Please share this video with a friend if you think it could help them or if they're interested in true crime like you are.